Well, good morning. It is uh, it's great to see everyone. Those who are watching online today, thank you for connecting with us. Uh, as, as part of the church, uh, we have to realize the church is so much bigger uh, than, than what it is we do just right here. Um, and so I'm going to ask a question. Do you have a defining moment in life? I, I, I think most of us probably have not just a defining moment, but defining moments, moments where we're at a crossroads, uh, moments where we have the opportunity to rise to the occasion or fail. And, and many of our defining moments are probably marked with success. And there are other defining moments that are marked with failure. That's just a reality of life. And I think about defining moments, I I filter things, in fact, if, if you're in my family, uh, unless you're my daughter, my daughter doesn't really care, you, you filter through sports or movie quotes. And, and so I think a lot about sports, and defining moments are, are real when it comes to sports. In fact, I, I think about commentators love those clutch moments, the shot that happens at the end of the game. Yeah, there's, there's two outs, uh, and there's two strikes, and the bases are loaded, and it's the bottom of the ninth inning. It's the Hail Mary pass uh, with seconds to go in a football game. And they'll say it all comes down to this. So I don't know if every defining moment all comes down to this. But we have defining moments. Moments that we can look back and realize that maybe my life changed just a little bit because of that moment right there. One of mine happened in 19... 89. It was in Ashland, Kansas, which is almost Oklahoma. It was the, the conference meet, track meet. And uh, I typically ran the 800 and then would also run an 800 uh, at, during the 3200 meter relay. Now that particular year, I had developed something because of a random act of stupidity and cold weather, a lingering cough. And when I say a lingering cough, this thing stuck around for like two or three months. And it was such a bad cough that when I would run in track, the routine was I would run, I would finish running, I would cough until I threw up, and then I would go to the next race. Well, that particular day, I had run uh, the 800 uh, on two different occasions, and I had done my routine of run, cough, throw up a couple of times. And so my day is done, and in one hand I have Dr. Pepper. <laughs> in another hand I have a half-eaten hot dog. And that's where I see my track coach walk up, and he had a persuasiveness about him. Now, to give you a little bit of a context, this is the year 1989. The, the previous nine years... My high school had won the conference track meet. So there was pressure to do number 10. And so he walks up to me, again, Dr. Pepper, hot dog, thinking I'm done for the day. And Coach DeVore says, Brandy baby, we need points. So I went ahead and penciled you in for the, thir the, the 3,200 And, and listen, not putting pressure, you can say no. <laughs> and so I ran, powered by Dr. Pepper and a half-eaten hot dog. I ran. And, and let me tell you what happened. It was such a phenomenal thing that something came over me, and I got first, and... And our team was catapulted to victory. Actually not. Uh, that, that did not happen. It didn't. Dr. Pepper and half-eaten hot dog did me no favors. I think I got like fifth or sixth. And, and the reality is the couple points that I got didn't matter because our, our track team was so good that year that we just demolished everybody. 
But that was a defining moment, not because I ran the race. But I figured out a couple things about life. Sometimes you got to do what you don't want to do. And sometimes you have to push through, even when Dr. Pepper and half-eaten hot dog are killing you. So that was just it. And I think all of us could maybe look back at moments in our life and say that, you know what, that was an important lesson. That was a defining moment. Maybe a deadline at work. Maybe it was a, it was a half marathon or a 5K. Maybe it was a character test where you realized who you were. Maybe it was a failure. But nonetheless, it was a defining moment. So today, we're going to begin a new section in the book of Mark. And, and I think in, in the book of Mark, this might be one of the major defining moments in the entire book. In fact, in the life of the disciples, I, I think this is where everything changes. This is where it all comes down to this. Because you see, Jesus asks his followers a question. And it's not just a big question, it is the big question. Their lives hung in the balance on how they answered this question. But here's the reality. How you and I answer that question, that too becomes a defining moment. So we're going to dive in. We're going to dive in and understand that there's an important question, but not only is there an important question that we must ask, there's, there's also the reality that if we answer this one correctly, well, life's got to change. Well, in fact, life will, will drastically change by the way that we answer this particular question. So if you have your Bibles today, uh, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 8. And in the Bibles and the seats in front of you, that is page 844. We're going to start with verse 27. And it says, And Jesus went on with, with his disciples to the village, uh, villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? Now, it's interesting that Jesus asks a big question. This isn't the big question, but he asks a big question, but they're just walking down the road. Uh, it, it, they're, they're not in class. They're not in church. They're just in, in, in a relationship sort of thing where Jesus, they're walking down the road, and Jesus said, so guys, tell me who people say that I am. And notice verse 28. And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others say one of the prophets. We talked about that repetition thing a couple weeks ago. This, again, is one of those repeated instances in the book of Mark. But here's the thing. They say, well, okay, well, here's the word on the street. Word on the street is, well, you're Elijah. Elijah was taken up uh, by a, a fiery chariot, chariot in, into heaven. Many people presumed he would return. Uh, Others said, well, John the Baptist, John the Baptist was killed, and, and maybe you're him that has come back to life, or maybe you're one of the, the prophets of old. And I said this a, a, a few weeks ago when we were in this particular passage, but I think it's, it's worth repeating. Public opinion about Jesus is plagued with misunderstanding. Listen, if you go down to Walmart today, if you go down to, to Smith's, or you go into the mall in Albuquerque and, and just start asking people, who is Jesus, you're going to get a lot of answers, and a lot of those answers are going to be plagued to misunderstanding. That, that, that's a reality. So this time, though, Jesus doesn't just let, let them hang with, who do people say that I am? He probes a little bit deeper, and it says this, and he asks them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Christ. In Matthew, the, the question is, you, who do people say that I am? And Peter answers, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. But Mark just 
uses four words. You are the Christ. So the big question, who do people say that I, who do people say that I am? And, and listen, this, this is a defining moment. In fact, I, I'm going to venture to say that most followers of Jesus, when they think about this particular uh, question right here, they look back and say, when I answered this, this was the defining moment of my life. Everything changed after this point in time. And so Peter says, you are the Christ. Now, how many of you have just heard and maybe thought that Jesus Christ, Christ is the last name of Jesus? Because sometimes that's kind of how it's presented in the church. It's either Jesus or Christ or Jesus Christ. Now, the word Christ is the Greek word for anointed. And the, the word uh, Messiah, Jesus the Messiah, uh, would, would, would have been the Hebrew word for, uh, for, for Messiah. And, and ultimately, or for Christ, for the anointed, in the Old Testament, there would have been this idea, there would have been this notion, there was kind of a big notion idea, that there was this perfect king who would come and fulfill all of the promises of God. And so when Peter says, you are the Christ, I think one of the things that's important for us to understand is that, that Peter is saying, Jesus, you are the promised Messiah. You are the, the promised king, the anointed king that is going to bring all of the promises of God. Now, this is a pretty bold claim. And the reason why this is such a bold claim is, listen, uh, there were countless knockoffs during the day and age of Jesus. People who were saying, I am the Christ. And there was all kinds of, of, of theories and ideas and speculations on who this would be. But notice that, that Peter doesn't say, you know what, I think you are. Or you're in the running. Or you might be. He makes an emphatic statement, you are the Christ. You are the, the, the promised Messiah. And, and I think what Peter says here is, is something for us to understand, is that Jesus didn't meet their expectations. See, they had built up into their mind what the Messiah was going to be like. They had built up in their mind of this, this political savior, this, this national savior that would come and make everything right and, and they would be able to live in peace among the Romans and the Romans would be kicked out and there would be this new and incredible kingdom. And, and so they had this idea and Jesus did not fill those expectations. He was not what they really wanted. But I think one of the things that we have to understand, especially if we see the big picture, Jesus isn't what they wanted but he was certainly what they needed. And listen, there's a world today, there's a world today that has an idea about Jesus, has assumptions about Jesus, has ideas about Jesus. They have a Jesus that they have built up in their mind, and it's the Jesus they want. It's our job to show them and tell them about the Jesus that they need. That he is the promised one of God. And that he can, he alone can give us grace and forgive us of our sin. So with that, Jesus, interestingly, in verse 30, it says, and he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Uh, to me, this just sounds odd. Anybody? I mean, we've, we've been going through, and we're at this defining moment, and there's like this, this, this pinnacle point where everything had been leading up to this point. All of the misunderstanding, all of the controversy, all of the miracles, everything. Jesus is leading his disciples to this point so that they would claim you are the Christ, and then he says, but don't tell anybody. 
And I think one of the things we have to understand is the divine timing of God is Jesus isn't quite ready for this to be made public. But notice what happens next. Verse 31. And he began to teach them. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Now, I I think we have to understand, Peter is not talking calmly to Jesus. He's given Jesus the what for. He is, he's chewing Jesus out, saying, absolutely not. In fact, he says, but, uh, but turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Again, he's not like Peter. He's given Peter the what for. And he says, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Now, uh, here's, here's my theory. Here's my theory. It's that Jesus has now for eight chapters, for half of the book of Mark, I don't know where we are in the life and ministry of Jesus, if this is the halfway point or the two-third point or a month away he's going to the cross. I, I don't know exactly where this is, but Jesus has taken his disciples along on a journey that they can see and they can experience and they can Uh, marvel at all of the things that Jesus had done. And even with their misunderstanding, even with their, their, their hardness of heart, they have reached the point to say, you are the Christ, the Son of God. But now, but now, Jesus kind of says, okay, now we're square. Now that we've established who I am, Let's get down to business. And getting down to business was giving them some spiritual insight, some insider information that no one else had. Like, listen, I, if, if you know that I am the Christ, let me tell you what the Christ has come to do. And I'm going to die. And, and I'm going to be killed, and three days later, I'm going to rise again. Now, with that, Peter, Peter the spiritual giant 30 seconds ago, (laughs) goes back to not getting it. And I think one of the things that we have to understand is saying Jesus is king means we begin to see things through the eyes of God, not man. That's one of the things that I, I think we have to understand is that when we say Jesus is king, we now change from the perspective of man to a spiritual way of thinking. Notice what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. He says, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. When we claim Jesus as king, there is a shift in our mind. There's a shift in in the way that we think. There's a shift in the way that we see people. There is a transformation of our minds that must take place when we follow Jesus. And so Jesus is essentially saying, listen, Peter, I've told you these spiritual things, but you're still thinking like a man. You're not thinking through the mind of God and not seeing things through the eyes of Jesus. Then we go on. We go on and and we read as far as what Jesus begins to teach them. And, you know, as I read on and as I think back, I, I begin to think, I have so much more room to grow. And that really too much of my life is spent thinking through the eyes of man and not God. Anybody struggle with that? So let's go ahead and read on at verse 34. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said, 
if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For who would, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it, does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of my, me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And then he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the, sing, uh, the kingdom of God after it has come with power. I think there's, there's probably a couple ways to look at this last verse. I think it's pointing to what actually Jim's going to dive into next week. Uh, he's going to dive into what's called the transfiguration and the importance of that uh, in, in the life of Jesus. So listen, there's a lot here, and there's a lot to digest here about what Jesus just said. But let me just say it like this. Saying Jesus is king comes with clear expectations. We talk about the transformation of the mind. There's also, when I say Jesus is king, there is a transformation in, in my character and in my behavior. There's going to be a radical change in my life. And, and folks, I, I have to look at my own life and say, you know, the whole idea of what is it, you know, what does it gain a man if he profits the world yet forfeits his soul? So much of our time is spent on building our kingdoms here rather than the kingdom of Christ. So much of our time is spent on earthly stuff. So much of my mind I think is how many, how often do I how often do I see a brand new truck and go God let's talk. Right? How much of our time is spent online looking for stuff that is going to build our kingdom here? And, and ultimately, what Jesus is saying, if you're going to call me king, the self-centered, hypocritical, egotistical life that you used to live has to die. You have to lose that, that, that absorbed self. And make it about me. And quite honestly, I want to keep my life but gain Jesus. I want to be comfortable and still have Jesus. I want all the stuff And still have Jesus. I don't want to be uncomfortable. I don't want to suffer for the cause of Christ. Yet Jesus says, listen, following me means you leave it all behind. That you are willing to lay aside everything everything, even your very life, for me. Actually, what we're going to do during this series over the next couple of weeks, we're going to dive into some of those clear expectations that Jesus lays out that says, listen, if you want to know what life change looks like for one of my followers, this is what it looks like. And quite honestly, there's going to be some uncomfortable stuff. But one of the things that we have to understand is that when Peter called Jesus the Christ, he also was referring to him as saying, you're the king. You're the king of your kingdom. And in fact, the very beginning of the book of Mark, Mark lays out the case that one is coming that is going to be greater 
than Caesar. A king greater than Caesar, a kingdom greater than Rome is coming. And Peter makes the claim to say, you're that king bringing that kingdom. So you want to know what it all comes down to? You want to know the defining moment? Here it is. If you call Jesus king, he gets to be king. If you call Jesus king, he gets to be king. If I call Jesus king, he gets to be king. And and, and so basically, I say I'm no longer in control. If, If he's king, now listen, this is kind of foreign to us. And one of the reasons why this is foreign to us is because we have lived in the, a, a country, and I love this country, and I would not want to live anywhere else in all of the world, but we have a country that says, we the people, right? We the people are the sovereign authority, right? And, and so we have this mentality that I'm my own boss. In, in our government system, the government works for the people. Hopefully. <laughs> but in the ancient world, it was not we the people, it was me the king. And the king made autocratically the rules that needed to be made. And there was no approaching the king and saying, all right, let's talk about this. In fact, I read something recently in a book that was profound to me. If my preference and my opinion differs with the opinion of Jesus, I have to assume assume that I'm wrong and he's right. That's what it means to let Jesus be king. And so, a couple of ways for us to own this here today. Maybe you have the need in your life for the true defining moment. And maybe you need to answer the most important question. You need to ask yourself, who do I say that Jesus is? You see, you will at one point in time answer that question. In fact, it tells us in the book of Philippians that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess who Jesus is, that he is, in fact, Lord. So you will do this at some point in time. It would just be better for you if you went ahead and answered this right now. But also this is when I identify who Jesus is, He becomes king of my identity. One of the more dangerous things that is happening in our culture and society today is identity politics. In fact, what what we've done is the more we can stack our identity, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this, the more I can stack my identity, uh, I I guess the, the more prominent or the more victimized I will become in my society, so therefore I will get attention. But here's the reality. When I say Jesus is king, he gets to be king of who I am. He gets to determine my identity. And my identity becomes first and foremost child of the one true God. My identity is first and foremost attached to the person of Jesus. More than my race, more than my ethnicity, more than my nationality, more than the color of my skin, it becomes Jesus because he's my king. And if you say Jesus is king, he gets to set the agenda. I think I talked about this a while back, but Sunday evening every week, I write out my agenda for the week. I write out my most important tasks that I need to get done for the week. 
And I've been convicted as of late that before I do that, I talk with Jesus, and I kind of say, Jesus, what's your agenda for this week? And how do you want my agenda to line up with yours? Because if he's king, he's in the driver's seat. If he's king, he gets to set direction in my life. He gets to determine who I am, where I go, what I do. Will you join me in prayer? Father God in heaven, thank you that you are king. You are king of kings and lord of lords. May we not just say you are king and offer lip service. May you truly be king. Thank you. In the name that is above every name, Jesus. Amen.